as a student of English myself, uh, whenever I speak English, you guys know that this is not my first language, I first conceptualize the idea as clearly as I can. And it's this idea that starts to trigger all sorts of related words and expressions in my brain. Hi, hello and welcome to another episode of China Teacher, where I share with you what it is like to be an English teacher in China. Today, I want to tackle a question that I ask myself from time to time. Will automatic translators ever beat human translators? And what would be the consequence for us language teachers if this ever happened? If you want to know what my thoughts are regarding this topic, don't go anywhere. And see you on the other side of the intro. Welcome back everybody, thanks for sticking around after the intro. Hey, a short message for the new viewers. In this channel, I talk about three things. I talk about what life is like as a teacher here in the country, I also give you guys tips and strategies for teaching, and uh, from time to time I give you some insights into uh, what China is like. So if you dig any of these topics, then consider subscribing to my channel. And when you do that, don't forget to hit the bell button to be notified whenever there is a new video out, all right? Well, with that out of the way, let us jump right into the topic. Chances are that you've already seen AI translation in action, whether it is on your Facebook feed or through browsing international websites uh, using Google, or if you're here in China when you use WeChat. But a fact that few people pay attention to is that translation between human languages is a $50 billion a year business. And artificial intelligence, specifically speaking, machine learning, has proven to be very competent at translating large amounts of information very quickly. In 2018, uh, the CEO of One Hour Translation gave an interview and he used uh, the Kodak versus digital photography analogy. And he said that Kodak simply didn't see it coming. He thinks that this is going to happen to human translators. He also mentions that within one to three years, neural machine technology translators, we're going to talk about those today, will be able to carry more than 50% of the work handled by human translators. Now, these NMT translators, they rely basically on a neural network. Um, neural networks are a system that can be trained to recognize patterns in data. So they're able to transform some input data, let's say, for example, a sentence in French, into a desired output, let's say a sentence translated to English. No matter how these things work, one thing is true here. The quality of machine translation has improved by leaps and bounds in the last couple of years. Um, in his interview, uh, he also mentioned that uh, in 2018, on average, 10% of machine translated documents needed to be fine-tuned by humans. But only two years ago, that figure was around 80%. The big difference was this new system that they've come up with. Now, the old system initially worked by translating phrases, but now this AI technology takes the context of an entire sentence into consideration when it's making the translation, which makes it much more accurate. Now, the, the phrase-based system translated sentences word by word, sometimes looking at short phrases. But these new neural networks, they consider the whole sentence at a time. They, they are able to do this by using a particular kind of machine learning component that is known as LSTM, or Long Short Term Memory Network. Um, this allows the computer to basically reprogram themselves. In other words, what these systems are able to do is they reconsider the translation they have done thus far in a sentence from left to right with every new word that you input and they will make modifications to the translation if they seem them necessary. Now, another important tool for this kind of learning component is the rate this translation function that you see on Google Translate. Um, this function allows the neural network to update uh, its data in real time through your input. This way, the system can account for uh, things like context or slang, typos, abbreviation, and even intent as it continues to, to learn with each translation. This is why, for example, you can type BRB and that will be translated into I'll be right back. All these learning components in machine translations are referred to as deep learning, uh, a term that I think is used misleadingly, but we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, in a moment. Okay, so hold that thought. Now, the next logical question is, how is the quality of machine translation measured then? 
Well, there, there is an algorithm that is called Bleu or Bilingual Evaluation Under Study that evaluates the quality of text which has been machine translated from one natural language into another. The, the quality of automated translation is um, understood as the correspondence between a machine's output and that of a human translation. So basically, the closer a machine translation is to a professional human translation, then the better that translation is. Now, talking about deep learning again, it is falsely claimed by a lot of promoters of deep learning that um, training a neural machine to translate between languages requires nothing more than feeding large quantities of material in whichever languages you want to translate between um, into these neural net algorithm. And in time, this will produce a perfect translating machine. But the adjective deep here is being exploited. Let's talk about that. When, when you hear that Google bought a company called DeepMind, uh, whose products uh, have deep neural networks and that are enhanced by deep learning, you cannot help but think that the word deep means profound, powerful, insightful. And yet, well, the meaning of deep in this context comes simply from the fact that these neural networks have more layers than the older networks. These ones have 12 layers, while the other ones had two or three. But does that sort of depth really imply that whatever work these networks are doing is profound? I don't think so. It is almost irresistible for people to think that a piece of software that deals so fluently and quickly with words must surely know what these words mean, but it doesn't. It is really important for you guys to realize how devoid of content all these words that are thrown on the screen really are. This is a, the classic illusion associated with artificial intelligence. Um, it's called um, a de Eliza effect. Back in the 1960s, Eliza was a phrase manipulator that seemed to understand English. You see, Eliza pretended to be a psychotherapist and doing that, the people who interacted with it had that, that feeling, that sensation that it could understand their feelings and their thoughts. And perhaps you feel the same way when you talk to Siri or Alexa or, well, perhaps to your car voice activated command system. You feel like these systems understand what you want, they understand your commands. That is only one way of a two-way street because the fact is, algorithms will need a lot of time to be able to gather all the necessary experience and understanding of the language to be able to use words in any meaningful way. All these answers, replies, responses and interactions that you get from these systems, they need to be programmed by somebody. There's something lacking here and that's understanding. The machine translation has never focused on understanding language. This industry has focused mainly on trying to decode or correlate words without really worrying about what understanding and meaning really are. So here are the three reasons why I think that we're very, very far from having the perfect translating machine and thus us teachers becoming obsolete. Number one is that the meaning of language is always context-based. And so far, these machine translators that use this long, long short-term memory thing, the, the power to reassess a translation with every new word, they, they seem like they cannot store, they cannot remember the choices that they have made in previous sentences. Take this example, take a look at this screen. If you type, Paul is a man, he is a nurse, in a gender neutral language like Malay, for example, Google Translate will translate that into English as, Henry is a man, she is a nurse. Why? Well, because the machine relies on the training data that it has received, and it then assumes that a nurse is female and a programmer is male, because the training data contain more examples of female than male nurses and more examples of male than female programmers, regardless of whatever context you have provided in the sentences before. Google Translate is not familiar with this kind of situations. Google is only familiar with strings composed of words composed of letters. It's all about quick processing of pieces of text. It's not about thinking or imagining or remembering or, or understanding. Google Translate doesn't even know that words stand for things. Now, number two, 
language cannot be separated from culture. If you take an example of a Chinese business setting, yeah, it is considered polite and necessary for the host to insist and impose on a guest to accept an invitation to have more food. That's, that's just basically what they have to do to show sincerity and hospitality. Chinese people will use the imperative form, such as uh, you must eat or eat more, you're not eating enough during this actual uh, business meal. Now, despite the fact that this may sound like it's an order, it is absolutely not in this particular context. You see, requests and invitations in Chinese may sound like impositions or even warnings when they are translated out of this cultural context. And uh, at number three, we got to remember that language is closely related to human emotions. So the subtleties of the, the voice and the tones have impact in the meaning. An automatic translator will never be able to capture this. We all know that speech patterns like punctuation, for example, can lead to controversial meanings. You remember this meme, right? A woman without her man is nothing as opposed to a woman without her man is nothing. I don't need to explain the issues there. So to kind of like wrap up this video, um, the idea that language teachers will become unnecessary and obsolete just because automated translation has made great improvements over the last couple of years, it to me is, is far from reality. To me, the word English teacher denotes a, a human art form that uh, allows people to graciously carry clear ideas in their language into clear ideas in English. And well, when they do this bridging, they should maintain not only the clarity, but also um, a flavor, uh, an idiosyncrasy in the mind of the speaker. As a student of English myself, uh, whenever I speak English, you guys know that this is not my first language. I first conceptualize the idea as clearly as I can. And it's this idea that starts to trigger all sorts of related words and expressions in my brain. Needless to say, this, this happens very quickly, it's almost instantaneous and unconscious, but only when the concatenation of word has been sufficiently thought in my mind, do I start to try to express it in English. And, well, to me, that's the kind of thing that I imagine when I hear the expression deep mind. Now, despite everything that you have seen in this video, I realize that Google Translate offers invaluable services for many people. It's just a quick and dirty conversion of meaningful passages written in a certain language into not necessarily very meaningful strings of words in another language. But as long as the text in the, well, the target language is somewhat comprehensible, then many people feel perfectly satisfied with the end product. If they can get the, the general, the basic idea of a passage in a language that they don't know, then they're happy with that. But to me, this is very far from what we do as teachers. When you teach a student to use the language, we're, we're teaching them to do much more than just translating. So I'll be interested to know what you guys have to say in the comment section down below about this topic. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you guys for watching this video. And as always, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you like the content of this channel, then consider subscribing to it. And if you do that, I recommend you to hit the bell button to be notified whenever I have a new video out. Okay, guys, until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now.